Uh, my name is Eric Rice, and I'd like to welcome you to today's event uh, on behalf of the Urban Health Institute and the School of Education. Um, this is a part of the Urban Health Institute series on understanding racism and white privilege, um, and it's also sponsored by the School of Education and particularly our doctoral students who have a monthly seminar series. So if you like what you hear, keep, an eye, keep your ears and eyes open for other Wednesday talks, um, and there's some information on your seat about the next one coming up in April. Um, I'd like to, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Christina Bercini. She's an assistant professor in the Department of English at the University of Wisconsin at um, Eau Claire. An East Coast native um, where perhaps the seeds for today's talks were uh, formed in her experience auditioning for Broadway productions. Um, she left New York and earned her PhD in curriculum, instruction, and teacher education with an emphasis in English education from Michigan State University. Her areas of interest and specialization are secondary English education and English teacher education, critical race studies, critical pedagogy, social justice, and issues in urban education. Uh, her scholarship centers on uh, critical whiteness studies and has appeared in the Journal of Adolescent and Adult Literacy, English Education, and the International Journal of Critical Pedagogy, as well as other scholarly venues. Um, and her creative work has been featured in Empty Sink Publishing, 5 to 1 Magazine, Success.com, Huffington Post, and other outlets. And most recently, her Education Week teacher article, Why Are All the Teachers White?, has been selected by She Knows Blog Her Media as a 2016 Voices of the Year honoree. If you like what you hear today, I just wanted to let people know that she's also going to be doing a uh, event tomorrow morning, a community event at... Um, Amazing Grace Lutheran Church down near the Medical Center. That's at uh, 9.30, breakfast is provided, so it's an extra special event. Um, and that'll be on how to be white, it'll be a, she'll discuss her chapter, how to be white, a primer, from what does it mean to be white in America. So there uh, is information at the Urban Health, Web, in, Urban Health Institute website if you have any interest in that. So without further ado, um, Dr. Christina Bercini. We're good back there? Okay, I'll try to project well. Um, just one warning that I like to give. These are not bifocals, they're just reading glasses, so I do a lot of looking over them at you. I'm not trying to pull a Dumbledore. If I look through them, you're very blurry. So I'll look over them when I'm not reading, just a heads up in case you're wondering. Um, so as Eric said, my name is Christina Bercini. And I'm a qualitative researcher who focuses on the preparation of literacy teachers for diverse and multicultural contexts. My interests lie in critical whiteness studies and multicultural education as those realms intersect with um, English education and literacy education. And I'm going to share with you aspects of my research agenda as it informs my teaching. So just to um, sort of help orient you into the geography of this discussion, I'm going to briefly share aspects of my positionality as it relates to the frames governing my work, um, the focus of which is on teachers' racial identity development. And from there, I'm going to share a visual example of how contexts shape teachers' identities. And from there, I'm going to share a classroom example of what this shaping might look like as well. Um, and then after that, I will offer a discussion of implications and possibilities. And if there is time and inclination and interest, I also have what I'm calling a bonus round. So um, another opportunity for some reader's theater work with a very different teacher in a very different context. Um, so to begin, a discussion of my positionality, I think, helps to contextualize some of the theoretical frames that I bring to my research and teaching. So I am a product of the New York City public school system. The schools I attended were highly scrutinized by politicians and the media, and the mayor shut my high school down a few years after I graduated due to his interpretation and the city's interpretation of um, low achievement, low test scores, that kind of thing. Um, so a lot like what I think is going on in Baltimore public schools from what I've been reading in some of the more recent headlines. So I have a particular interest and investment 
in schools and communities that have been disenfranchised by external forces. Um, I come from a working class family, and my K through 12 schooling was best defined by racial, ethnic, linguistic, and socioeconomic diversity. And this was true right up until I attended college, where for the first time in my life as a student, everyone that I went to school with looked exactly like me. And that never happened before until I attended college. So my narrative is sort of the opposite of what they say about pre-service teachers who um, probably attended predominantly white schools, K through 12 settings, and then they go to college and they experience diversity for the first time ever, right? We're familiar with that narrative of the white pre-service teacher in the teacher education research. So I come to my research and teaching with my experiences, as we all do, and my intersectionality as a white woman, but also all of these other things that I bring to the classroom. And over time, I noticed a really troubling, dominant narrative about pre-service teachers in the research. And this narrative was sort of informing my nascent development as a teacher educator. My pages are sticking together. So this narrative delivers a single story of white pre-service teachers who, as we know, make up the vast majority of the teaching population. And in an attempt to prepare teachers for anti-racist work, the research has predominantly focused on individual personal characteristics, often described as failings, right? To the exclusion of the broader contextual forces that help to shape a teacher's identity. Although that particular research is beginning to proliferate. Um, admittedly, I was not always troubled by this narrative. And despite my own experiences and my understanding of intersectionality and my beliefs that teachers bring a wide array of experiences to the table, I bought into this single story about who they are. And when I was a TA many moons ago, my assumptions were race-based. So much so that a student called me on it. And I do not remember the exact details of what I was teaching on that day, but it was some intersection between multicultural education and literacy education. And I suspect that my pedagogies were probably pretty focused on mimicking the literature. So I think I was probably encouraging my presumably deficient students to own up to their racialized privileges and to stop being so oblivious, right? This is what the research talks about. This is what the research describes predominantly. Um, so if you can imagine a grown man teacher education student, probably in his early 20s, lays his head in his arms on his desk and starts mock sobbing. He's mock crying, um, making fun of me, pretty much. And this is what he says to me. So he amused his peers, right? I was amused, for sure. Um, and while it was really funny in the moment, it was also really transformative for me. And that moment, uh, it was from then on that I began to theorize teachers' racial identity development um, differently. I worked toward theorizing it a bit differently. So I'll highlight a few ideas that helped me along the way. Um, in the interest of brevity, I won't spend too much time reviewing the literature. But these insights here are pivotal to my rehabilitated approach to exploring white racial identity development. For example, um, I find the middle to be most poignant. White people are never just white. We are also always positioned within gender, language, sexuality, class, ability, size, ethnicity, and age, for example. At some times and in some places, those privileges and that safety that come with white skin can be temporarily and problematically overridden or eclipsed. So Ellsworth's words give rise to the idea that context plays a role in shaping and reshaping identities. And what I have found in my own work is that to ignore or to leave out the role that contexts play in structuring teachers' identities 
is to ask the impossible of the race conscious teachers who enter those contexts. So Mr. Antolini was such a teacher. Bonus points for anyone who knows where the name Antolini came from, that's a pseudonym. Anyone at all? No English ed people here? Catherine the Rye. Mr. Antolini, right? Yeah, I guess that was his favorite character in Catcher in the Rye. Um, Mr. A was one of my, uh, my, my subjects chose their pseudonyms, so that was his. Um, Mr. A was one of my study participants, and he taught eighth grade English language arts in a very racially and culturally diverse school. And in thinking about Mr. A's work, I wondered whether um, Armistead Gardens Elementary might make for an apt comparison um, as a school where more than 50% of the student population consists of students of color. So teachers in Mr. A's school were required to implement no less than five behavior management models into their teaching and curriculum. And this image represents three of those models. So we have something called pride. You probably cannot see the words from where you are, but I'll get to that in a minute. We have something called pride. Um, we have uh, some sort of scale, a zero through four scale that the school used to measure student noise. And then we also have something called slant. And to this day, I never quite understood what that was or how it was used. I just know that it was some sort of behavior management mechanism in that school. Um, so this is some interview data from Mr. Antolini's case. These kids especially need very strict, stringent guidelines, not a bunch of exceptions about, you know, oh yeah, I guess if you're going to have a good reason to get up, you can get up, etc. It bothers me if I have to have everyone seated in absolutely silence, and if they want to get up and get a tissue to raise their hand and ask me permission, that's not me, you know. I'm much more free-flowing, a little bit of background noise is okay, that sort of stuff. But the kids can't handle that, so it's hard for me, it's almost more work for me, because I have to be who I'm not. I have to fight my natural instincts to be what they need. So his words initially are a bit reminiscent of the descriptors that I brought up earlier, right? That that deficient white teacher um, with his assumptions about who his urban students are. But these systems were employed, these systems were employed from the top down to remind students that they are to always remain silent or near silent and to allow for direct instruction. Teachers are required to invoke the phrase, we are at a zero, to remind students of this expectation, zero being the acceptable conversation level. And this is just one of the many directives students are expected to memorize and comply with. Other directives included controlling how they walk from class to class, and also how and with which attitude they use the restroom, as evidenced here. So I don't know if you can see that, but students are basically expected to relieve themselves with integrity. This is, yes, so let's all keep that in mind next time. Um, the school bought this, system, with this management system with actual money. They bought this to be able to use it. Um, Teachers were also expected to memorize these directives and to include them in the curriculum they taught and the language they spoke. I have found that the behavior management systems in this particular school not only influenced this teacher's language but also his expectations of his students. And this was despite his theoretical commitments. So we see where he was in the middle of the school year. This occurred in January of that year. But this is where he started in September. To me, teaching English for social justice is all about teaching students what power they have to change things. I don't think it's something you need a social justice unit for or anything like that. The reason I teach English is to try to help them become the best person they can be. So mostly, in my opinion, it's all about teaching them their own power to change things for what they think is best. So same teacher, same student, same school year, but you kind of wouldn't ever know it without the dates at the bottom. So I read his January words against the backdrop 
of multiple behavior <coughs> management systems that this school insisted the students need long before Mr. A arrived at the scene. And I employ critical race theory and scholarship about the hidden curriculum of whiteness to suggest that perhaps it is not a coincidence that the school student population is 62% students of color with 54% of the total student population on free and reduced lunch. These systems were not present in the other schools I visited where most of the students were white. I also suggest that we should not be surprised that this teacher began to speak a language that he was required to speak, although I do not believe that he adopted that language consciously. Michelle Fine says that once this process is sufficiently institutionalized and embodied, it becomes natural. And if we're not careful, we don't even notice it happening. And I suggest that maybe it's one task of teacher education to help develop in pre-service teachers the tools to recognize those invisible processes. And that is something I seek to understand through my research. So the question of what are the subtle processes that shape our pedagogies and our perceptions of students, and in what ways might those processes be racialized? So at this point, I want to offer a caveat. Um, White teachers comprise the vast majority of the teaching population. We know this to be true statistically. Um, but they are not our only audience, right? So I believe that all teachers benefit from identity work because all teachers are subject to the um, implicit and explicit discourses of their schools and the larger school community. So while I draw from critical whiteness studies as a frame for my research and teaching, I also rely on pedagogical tools and critical race theory and multicultural education to inform our personal, social, political, and intellectual experiences as racial and ethnic beings. And this is all with the goal of developing in pre-service teachers critical consciousness. So my recent scholarship takes up some of these traditions. Um, an example of my approach to how I go about research and also my work with students highlights the use of critical discourse analysis and also counter story as tools to analyze, um, for example, how multicultural literature has been framed for use by the common core in the interest of standardization and measurability. Um, the effect has been, has been actually silencing the multicultural content within the multicultural literature. So broadly, these are the frames that um, govern the work that I do. So this work has evolved into a project in which I'm using classroom data as reader's theater, and we'll see some of that soon. And I use this data in my teacher education classes. And I do this with the goal of helping pre-service teachers critically examine their pedagogical beliefs, but also with the goal of helping them to facilitate those difficult conversations around um, social issues using literature and curriculum. So the crux of this presentation really centers on a classroom example of this. Um, and I just want to highlight some of the particulars of this image. These students are obviously very young students. I have a few motivations for using them in the teacher education classroom. Um, there is not much available that discusses the use of reader's theater with higher education students, despite how um, so much qualitative data lends itself to a reader's theater format. So you'd be hard pressed to find reader's theater teaching materials that go above the eighth grade, unless we're dealing with Shakespearean plays or other popular plays or theater techniques proper. But mostly the strategy is located in the lower grades. So what we do know from studies that have been conducted with undergraduates, but also professionals in other fields, such as nursing or business, and those are the fields I borrow from to do my work, because the work doesn't exist, really, in teacher ed, um, is that Reader's Theater encourages deep exploration of text, but also provides an opportunity for critical reflection. So the kinds of things we want our pre-service teachers doing, right? Um, so it's basic, Reader's Theater is basically said to have the same benefits for higher ed students and professionals as it does for the K through 12 population, but more commonly the K through six population. So I bring this method to my um, teacher education courses and we're gonna move into 
an example of that. So um, we're going to transition into the work of Mr. Kurt. And he is a literacy teacher in a white rural school district. Um, just as a point of comparison, I was doing some research on the schools in this area and the demographic makeup of his school just looks a whole lot like the demographic makeup of the private schools around Baltimore, um, just based on some research that I was doing of this area. And like Mr. Antolini from before, Mr. Kurt was a really socially conscious teacher and he openly talked about the problems he faced when trying to teach multicultural content to his predominantly white students. So in his words, especially because of the population I'm teaching now, it's very, very white. We're reading the Mississippi trial right now and they didn't seem to understand the problem. They're like, yeah, race is still a problem today, but I think they need to get over it, is what they say. So with this framing, we are going to move into um, scene one, and I think it's probably labeled as vignette one on, um, on the document that, that our readers have been given. But for the rest of us, um, the script will be up here as well. So Mr. Kurt, we're gonna start with you. All right, so we need, uh, we need Jay, Meg, Jamie, and Cabe, Cabe. up here, all right. This is the interactive part, so. Um, all right, I'm gonna stand over here and then hold the mic for you guys so people can hear and it's on the video, but. A hate crime is when you do something out of hatred towards a different group. There was much more racism in Emmett Till's time. I don't think it has to do with race or what color you are. I think it has to do with social status. I hate the way the media makes fun of redheads. South Park does this all the time. <laughs> if there are people in our school who are racist, what can we do as the next generation to change that? If they think we're racist, they just shouldn't come here. Not all of us are racist. My grandpa on my mom's side is, is in the KKK, but I'm not a racist. In my opinion, if you're racist, you're raci racist. That's just the way you are. If that's how they choose to live, then that's just what, that just that, then that's just who they are. So that's the first scene. Um, <laughs> around. Thank you very much. Um, so what I like to do after a scene is to ask people what they see, what they notice. Um, if anyone wants to take a stab at what just happened, that is the scene in its entirety. Any interpretations? Yeah. Well, I feel like Jamie's connection to herself of what the media does and how that directly relates to him was a prime opportunity to explore that further. Question and extrapolate on that. Absolutely. So maybe a lost moment, right? A lost teachable moment for sure. Any other interpretations? Yeah. Uh, there was such a denial of responsibility that they could be part of a society and be able to do it. Which I think is a really common response, right? Um, anyone else want to take? An interpretive stab. Yeah. It seems like they're like othering racist racism. Yeah. And and also me kind of kind of considering racism as like over conscious action. Yeah. Um, and there isn't the awareness of a lot of racialized things that right. they themselves are using. Right. And so that is the perfect segue into um, into this discussion. And I want to put some of what you just said on Mr. Kurt. Mr. Kurt personalizes it, right? It, what can we do if people are racist kind of thing? He's making it an interpersonal thing and not the institutional thing that the discussion deserves, right? So 
when and, and on that, uh, along those lines, when racism is approached as personal, there's a categorical dissociation from the issue, right? And even a hopelessness, as we see in, um, in Meg's final response. And this is actually really reminiscent of what the research says goes on in teacher education when the, the topic is about white privilege and whiteness and trying to get white pre-service teachers to deconstruct their privilege. The research has said that um, there is a defensiveness, a hopelessness, um, denial, the sorts of things that seem to be going on here. Um, and for the record, I will be offering a very different interpretation of that particular research because I find it really unproductive. And um, current research is beginning to call out that research as being unproductive. Um, so we are going to set the scene for vignette two. And um, for, during this discussion, Mr. Kurt is using some key texts. This is his anchor text, The Mississippi Trial. If anyone wants to take a look at this afterwards, um, it's a young adult text that um, has been designated multicultural in this particular school district. He is also using a YouTube video of a Disney film critique, and um, he's using Band-Aids as a cultural artifact. And he's also using an article written by Leonard Pitts, a black novelist and journalist, who talks about his experiences with institutionalized racism. And I'm not a huge fan of reading slides that have so many words on them, but um, for the purposes of setting up this next scene, it is important for us to read through. So this is um, the Leonard Pitts article. So I'm, I'm in college, right, freshman year, and I get to talking with my roommate, this white guy named Reed, about our SAT scores. Reed's kind of sheepish, finally confessing that he scored only about 1,200. That's when I realized I have not done pretty well. I'd done pretty well for a student of John C. Fremont High in the poverty, crime, and grime of South LA. I'd done pretty well for a black kid. As it happens, I started classes at the University of Southern California at 15 years of age, got good grades, and came out four years later with my degree. So there was nothing wrong with my brain. I've always suspected my modest SAT score, and the fact that I was encouraged to celebrate it said less about me than about the expectations others had of me and kids like me. So yes, it touches me in a raw spot, this news that two states, Florida and Virginia, have adopted new education standards under which they would set different goals for students based on race, ethnicity, and disability. So with that context, we're setting the scene, uh, the next scene, scene two. So do you want people to come up here for scene two? Our scene two people. Scene two, scene two. So I'll be the narrator. Um, <laughs> you, do, you can slam them right here if you want. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll move my computer so it's safe. <laughs> Students have just finished reading the article. Mr. Kurt has not asked a question or made a comment. Isn't that kind of a bit racist? What makes you say so? Making the goal lower because the person's black? Should I yell? Uh, racism is pretty much discriminating against you because of the color of your skin. And this is exactly that. Uh, they're setting different goals for kids based on race. Do you know what the term white privilege means? Students collectively indicate that they are not familiar with this term. I can give you a very small example. What color are flesh-colored Band-Aids? And cave incredulous in tone. Are you really comparing this to Band-Aids? What color skin does every Disney character have, except for one? Cave dramatically slams both fists on his desk and leans forward indignantly. Now you're comparing this to Disney? The thing about Disney, I honestly, like Mr. Kurt, you're an awesome teacher, but I don't think Disney has anything to do with it. Really? Did you notice how every evil character has darker skin? Did you notice how the crows sound black, the hyenas and the Lion King sound black? The thing about the band-aids, I think they're overthinking it because I never thought... Mr. Kurt dramatically leans toward Cass and responds to her in a mock whisper. Psst! Because you're white. <laughs> what if the band-aids were black and we, and we called them flesh-colored band-aids? Well, yeah, then we would think about it. 
In this one Crest toothpaste commercial, they're checking people's mouths for germs. The black girl's mouth is dirtier than the white person's mouth. Now this is gonna bug me any time I put on a band-aid. <laughs> I love how Vito just, he brings the house down. Yeah. <laughs> so um, this was real. I, I was sitting there watching this go down. Poor Mr. Kirk. Um, the bell rang soon thereafter. This ended with cave. Finding a Band-Aid, someone had a Band-Aid with them, just happened to have it with them, and Cade grabbed the Band-Aid and ran up to Mr. Kurt and held it against his skin to prove that the Band-Aid did not match Mr. Kurt's skin exactly, so therefore, theory blown, right? There's no way. Um, and then when the bell rang and they left, Mr. Kurt laid face down on his classroom floor for a couple of minutes. He was just exhausted. Um, <laughs> and and. So here we are again. I'd like to ask what you notice. What does this make you think about? Um, do you want to take a stab at any sort of interpretations? No wrong answers in Burkini land. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, yeah, possibly. <coughs> Who else? Yeah. It strikes me as bizarre that, similar to his comment about him taking in a different direction, he clearly had an agenda, and the agenda may not have met the students where they needed to be met in order to have this kind of, kind of conversation, which then goes to the question about whether or not he knew his students well enough to know where they needed him to be, and that he kept pushing them in a space instead of asking them to get to that. institutionalized racism as a concept, right? Mr. Kurt begins to approach it as institutionalized. He makes that shift. Students, some students, seem to make that shift with him, as opposed to the previous scene. Um, Adam challenges the policy by questioning it, and Shane uh, restates the policy in his own words. And sitting there, I felt like it was a real um, light bulb moment for him. Um, and I felt like the same thing was true of Cass. It was sort of like they, I don't know, they kind of withered a little bit. And they were like, yeah, you know, this, this does matter, doesn't it? Um, and Meg offers her own example of racial representation in something as seemingly innocuous as a toothpaste commercial, right? Um, but I also, to my mind, I think this is pretty courageous teaching. He plows through in what is a really hostile environment. Um, and, and he does push. I, I think that, so this happened in the middle of the year. I think he, it certainly was not the first week of school, right? Um, I think he had a good sense of where students were by then. And um, learning should be uncomfortable, right? Learning should be difficult. So um, that he was pushing them in certain ways, I don't construe as a bad thing or a flaw or, um, or something he should have done differently. Um, 
But again, once he talks about racism as institutionalized, the students seem to follow suit in certain ways. And we have sort of a linear example of this um, in Meg's responses. So these were her scene one responses, and this was her scene two response. And, um, and Vito also seems to respond thoughtfully. So I feel like Meg's responses in particular um, inspire the question of how do we learn to notice when students are developing, right? And this isn't just located in the upper grades. We can do this in first grade. We can do this in sixth grade. Um, obviously, such a question is appropriate at the higher ed level. How do we learn to notice when students are developing? Um, so Mr. Kurt's work offers a few implications, the first of which deals with how white teachers are framed in the research. And I use Mr. Kurt's work to illustrate a different kind of framing. Chimimanda Adichie warns us about subscribing to a single story. And in the classroom example, we have a teacher engaged in a fairly visible struggle. And Mr. Kurt could have backed down uh, when students attempted to silence him. Um, I could see that being very uncomfortable for many teachers, and I could see many teachers kind of shying away from the discussion. But he doesn't, and, and this was something that was not just located to this day, this was across my work with him that year. He was always pushing his students to um, challenge their <coughs> perspectives. So with his work, I think I am attempting to provide um, a sort of counter argument that rejects the unproductive constructions of the white student teachers who enter our teacher education classrooms. And what Mr. Kerr was doing, it was certainly not perfect, but um, I do think it was courageous, and I don't mean just in the context, in the local context of his classroom, I actually mean a little more broadly than that. News headlines and internet comment sections, as I know well enough, given my own public writing on this. Um, and the media in general suggests that this is incredibly risky business, and maybe exponentially so for a first year teacher with few protections and little experience. There were also teachers fired over teaching Emmett Till content. So the same content, well, some of the same content that Mr. Kirk was using, teachers were fired for it. So I've been using Reader's Theater to help pre-service teachers sort of recognize and work through the uh, variety of contexts within which they teach, the context of the media, right? The context of their students, the context of their schools and communities, and particularly how students are a part of the context in which literature is read, studied, and interpreted, and so too <coughs> are teachers. So for me, it logically follows that students are also a part of the context in which identities are constructed and constrained. And all of these processes and contexts combine to inform whether and how teachers come to be teachers who teach in the spirit of anti-racism and multiculturalism. And this sort of uh, exploration has applicability across grade level. So this was a, a list that came out recently, a variety of multicultural texts that um, are said to inspire those conversations that we need to be having with students, right? Um, and I use the example of literature here, but an exploration of how context structure identities can go beyond literature study, as we saw with the example of Mr. A from before. Um, so some implications for instruction. Teachers transmit culture and stories about culture through literature, and this process is a lot less visible. The Mississippi Trial 1955 is a text that has been chosen across the country for inclusion on multicultural literature lists. Um, but the text chosen for this particular curriculum in this school is interesting. It is written by a white author who tells a story about racism in the Deep South and is based on real events. So in my work, I take a critical approach to this book by asking whose story is foregrounded and what are the implications of this framing for multicultural teaching. The foregrounding of Emmett Till on the cover suggests that 
It's Emmett Till telling the story, maybe. Um, but when you read the story, it's actually <coughs> Hiram Hilburn's story of his encounters with racism in the Deep South. So as a teacher educator of literacy and English ed, I ask, why does Hiram get to tell a story about racism? Given the array of texts of people of color that are available, why this text? What does it mean to sanction this text in an all-white school district? And what, does that, what role does that sanctioning play in the, um, in the context of, of structuring identities, but also in influencing a teacher's thinking, decision-making, and ultimately their development? So when a text um, like this is required curriculum in an all-white school district, I teach teachers to ask questions about these things, and I teach them to teach their students to ask questions about these things. So these are um, some of the explorations that I conduct in the lower stakes environment of um, the teacher education classroom. So to sort of close this out, um, this go, the Reader's Theater goes beyond a teaching tool for teacher education students. In their review of multicultural education, Grant and Slater have pointed out that focusing on the classroom teacher implies that schools are just fine as they are, except for the classroom teaching. So as with the exa examples of Mr. A and Mr. Kurt, examining how context structure teachers' identities enables more complex thinking about the work that they do, but also about the work that they don't do, right, and the constraints that they face. And for me, this has led to opportunities to advance discussions about teacher candidates in a way that attends to intersectionality, tensions, struggles, and even some ways by which teachers have taught themselves to teach under the radar um, in the interest of teaching in ways that they find to be more purposeful than those required of their schools. So that's my work. Thank you. to you and everyone else. Um, I do have what I'm calling a bonus round. It's just a different set of data about a different teacher in a very different school. And it's up to you and the audience about whether or how you want to uh, experience that or if you want to go, if you want to have questions about this first, it's fine. Well, let's go ahead. Um, I think there's a lot to chew on already, and why don't we take some questions, and then if there's uh, some additional time, we can do a bonus round. That sounds Does that work? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna play um, Phil Donahue or Jerry Springer if it gets ugly, and uh, pass the mic around. So anybody who has a question, please raise your hand, and I'll bring the mic to you. Thank you so much for everything that you presented. Thank um, you, were Kate, right? I was. Okay. I was. Um, so I'm, I'm clinical mental health, so, and we, are, we discuss this issue about multiculturalism from, from the counselor perspective and um, how we would deal with um, individuals that are of the opposite race or the race that we are not from, that, we, that, we don't, that we're right. not acclimated towards growing up. Um, and I feel that like hearing all this, my mind kind of says, okay, what's, what's the solution? Like, what's the real solution? Here? And so yeah. I, I kind of think that in, in an environment like this where you have a lot of people, one of the solutions is it's, it's about really putting your foot forward and looking at through the framework of, of the social justice. Mm -hmm. And how do you get involved with all these young people who are going, working in these schools or working in these counseling agencies, we have to really, become, that really has to become a part of who we are is actually going out and seeing these social injustices and being willing to advocate and to really think in terms of who is it that I can partner with um, to, to bring these, these issues to the forefront on the policy side, on the political side, through the, through the schools. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people need to get educated on this concept of white privilege and how this is benefiting some and how this is, this is kind of keeping others at the bottom. Um, so I think we have to really focus on what is it that we can do to really address this and we have to really think of how can we get ourselves involved in policy mm -hmm. and because that's where the, that's where the change really the trickle down effect really really takes place right. um, and and definitely from being a minority myself one of the call to actions that, that I have is that um, when reaching out to the youth 
um, we have to really say that we have to really start, um, we have to really engender these cultural leaders who are coming to the forefront and we need more, we need more minorities in these positions where they can have a level so that they can help improve the, the cultures. You know, um, especially as times are changing nowadays. So um, I think this is wonderful. And then once again, I just think that the social justice piece is something that, whether as counselors or as school um, teachers or wherever it may be, that that's something that we should always keep in the back of our mind is how can we get involved in something like that. Absolutely. Thank you. Anybody? Questions, comments? There you go. All right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm, I've been at the early childhood end of the spectrum for 38 years. So for me, and, and at the same time trying to kind of always explore kind of my own biases that I bring to children and, and to classrooms and I bring to adults that I work with too. Um, but it, in these particular examples, it's almost like I looked at some early childhood teacher practice in terms of like open-ended questioning and trying to give some you know flow and power to the students and there was a certain degree of that being closed off and whether you know this teacher had an agenda but I think considering that you know in any of this work is, is like um, I think allowing when that for in the second example where the student kind of gives an open-ended and there's kind of opportunity to sort of let that flow a little bit and, you know, what does anybody else think about that? Um, in this example, is, is it somewhere here? Which one were you talking about? Yeah, no, I think between Adam is kind of an open-ended yeah. piece and then the teacher does give an open-ended kind of, well, what do you think of that? Instead of, you know, later on, where it's much more it's sort of a guided, this is where I'm going to go with this because Shane also continues on sort of adding into kind of just the, the student's opinion um, and it could have taken off from there and instead it Mr. Kurt did go in a specific direction right after that versus sort of letting that allow allow that to flow and I mean we're getting that in early childhood just trying to let you know students flow out and expand and I think that that's the piece that I looked at here I understand that you know, it's important maybe to bring some of the other elements in, but I think this was, someone had said it over here before too, it was kind of a lost opportunity. Yeah, um, so I, so this is one strong example, I have another strong example of a teacher who um, is attempting to teach about the Holocaust and is really screwing up. Um, and I think Mr. Kirk can be said to be screwing up at certain points here. Um, I would argue that I don't know that any one of us would quite know what to do in the moment, right? And so um, mistakes are going to be made. There are going to be lost moments. I am sure he went home that afternoon and went to bed that night thinking I should have said this or I should have said that, right? Um, in terms of Mr. Kurt having an agenda, I just, I feel a responsibility to respond to that. Um, he has an agenda. He absolutely does. He wants his kids thinking about white privilege. He wants his 14-year-olds acquiring language they have not acquired before about whiteness and white privilege. That being said, um, all teaching has an agenda. All teaching is political. Talking about race is an agenda. Not talking about race is an agenda. Teaching algebra is an agenda. Teaching something else is an agenda. All teaching is political, and um, that is the stance that I take. For every question we're choosing to ask, we're choosing to ignore a hundred more. That's political. That's an agenda, right? That's how I feel about these things. Yeah? Do I need the microphone for the video over here? Yeah, sorry. I can talk really loud, I promise. Um, I, I 
so I'm going to build off just a little bit of there. And I, I mentioned this when I said that I made the first comment or whatever. I didn't, I don't have to be first, but I made a comment about him clearly having an agenda earlier. And that actually hits on exactly what was kind of dived there. And I, I just wanted to call out two points that I think would help me or would have helped me in this moment, just as a point of clarity for my brain. I think part of it for me is that watching it be enacted, Eric, this sounds terrible, but when Eric was being Mr. Kurt, I mean, this is not your fault, Eric. It's just what it came across to me. I'm sorry, we're gonna have to stop. That's right. No judging. <laughs> when Eric was Mr. Kurt and he leaned in and did the because you're white, it made it sound really condescending. And so in my head, I was like, okay, she wants us to be against the teacher. And then there was this part of me that was like, okay, she's bringing this up so that we learn something from the teacher. And unfortunately, in moments like this, I've taught pre-service teachers for a long time. And when I teach them in person, you have to say things like, hey, somebody's about to stand up and pretend they're a teacher or be a teacher in this moment. You don't get to judge them, right? You don't get to because you don't know how hard it is to be that person. Uh, Lizzie, my, my assistant director, was asked to be one of those people and I was like, oh my god, I'm not going to do that. I'm totally not going to do that. Because I didn't want to be judged by anybody in this room for doing an acting thing, you know? Like, and that's low, low, low risk, right? Like, who cares how well you did or didn't read off that piece of paper? But that teacher has super high risk. I might also indicate to you, though, that there might be a, an element of potential, like, personal bias. You have a clear, strong connection with Mr. Kurt. If you were in his classroom over an extended period of time and years and I didn't hear that from you until you started to talk about Meg like she was a person instead of a student in the class and then it's also clear that he has a good connection with them when Adam says you're an awesome teacher but like he clearly is giving him the out of like hey man you and me are, are simpatico but I'm still gonna press you right so in that moment he clearly does have relationships that I didn't see the first time around. And so anyway, I'm just adding to the context of like why I was thinking all of that and why this is hard, was harder for me yeah. in the moment to internalize. Yeah, um, and it's funny that, that you should say that. I love that commentary because it reminds me, I have actually had to remove a tiny little bit from the transcripts um, some language that was having a certain effect on the pre-service teachers that was distracting them from the teaching about whiteness. So for example, um, where was it? Uh, so Mr. Kurt, okay. <laughs> so the thing about Disney, I honestly like, Mr. Kurt, you're awesome, but Disney has nothing to do with it. Mr. Kurt, really, did you notice how every evil character has darker skin? Did you notice how the crows sound black, how the hyenas sound black? He actually finished that by saying, um, you should educate yourself before you tell me I'm wrong with my references. <laughs> so, talk, you, I mean, talk about condescending, right? Um, and, and yes, I knew Mr. Kurt for two years before my dissertation study, which is what this came from. He allowed me in his classroom, and he only allowed me because we had a relationship. So there's a, definitely that sort of thing going on. Um, but I, I don't uh, where is it? The, the whispering, <coughs> wherever the whispering is. I don't, oh, towards the end. I just, I don't know. I don't see that as, as a bad thing, you know? No, I, I was really providing context for how, when presented to me, and I felt like I was supposed to be responding to it. Yeah. Like I was an English teacher, and so if I am asking people to watch something, then perhaps when doing Reader's Theater, it's helpful to also provide context for tone and, sure. and intent so that yeah. I could have known he was supposed to look potentially like a supportive person or, I, I don't know, I mean, look, this is so deep. There are so many people. ways to do yes, it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Like, not trying to go down that road. Just... I think that's helpful. Context is necessary. Um, I wonder what you think the value in this example of Mr. Kurt kind of bringing in, like, he is talking about institutionalized racism, but in this mm, very relatable and very small way. And I wonder what you think the value of going that way instead of broadening the conversation more to where he was already talking about a very serious issue and saying, you know, maybe talking about housing or discrimination in larger issues that way. And I know that they're 14 year olds, but like you said at the end, the kid ran up with a band aid and tried to, you know, yeah, disprove his point. So I was wondering what you think the value is in going the other way, maybe to bigger issues rather than smaller too. So of course there is value. Um, this, this is one slice of classroom discourse. I have other data where he actually turned a lesson on giving speeches into um, a lesson about access to food. 
right? So he, there are other moments where he does those things. This is a moment. This is, and I think we have to keep that in mind. This is a small, short moment where, um, where he tries to do something impactful. And um, maybe for some students it worked. Maybe it made others angry. Uh, my purpose for using this with my pre-service teachers is really to ask, what would you add here? What would you not do here? What, you know, if you're the teacher in this situation, how do you think you'd respond? What kinds of questions would you ask? Um, because they have to be having these conversations in their classrooms. We talk a lot about, um, you know, it's sort of like the problem that he opened with, wherever that is, it's way in the beginning. You know, the focus on personal racism, interpersonal racism, um, I think he's recognizing that that over-focus is to the detriment of student learning. You know, for as long as people feel like they are not personally racist, they have nothing to worry about. And I think he recognizes that as a problem, right? So, um, so I think he's trying to work within that problem. I don't think he is fully articulated in, um, in how to work within that problem, but I do think he's doing his best in the moment. So. Thank you. Yeah. I, mine's more of a comment um, because um, I guess when we have conversations and seeing kind of how that conversation goes and explaining what racism is and um, how it's institutionalized, covert, or you know, over, um, like this gentleman said, uh, you know, we, you know, the most educated, aware of racism, they still have their own prejudices. And it's like, how do we get to a point of having that conversation with students where, you know, they're not gonna have a lesson on racism and be completely racism free for the rest of their life. And how do we get to a point of understanding with them on that conversation as a part of their identity that they're always learning right. um, to be okay to ask these questions uh, continually over through the course of their life and not say like, oh yeah, I learned about this, or I learned about Emmett Till, so I'm definitely not racist anymore. Right. Um, but to be able to understand that they're always gonna grow and learn and form their racial identity over, over time. I think being explicit in exactly that way is helpful, right? And I'm not sure that he was explicit in quite that way. Um, but yeah, it is a process, right? And, and it's one that I think is reliant upon relationships, too. He had really good relationships with his students. He had students who weren't even his students coming up to him in the hallway to hug him. Like, it was a weird sort of, he just had a school reputation for being a certain kind of guy. Um, that allowed him to sort of open the door to certain kinds of discussions. Um, again, he was a white teacher. His students were primarily white. So that is at play, too. Um, I think that that conversation would have looked really different, different had he not been a white teacher. I, I couldn't imagine what those student, how those students would respond. It was a, a rural school district, right? It was more diversity in the classroom based on what they're saying and seeing their peers hear some of the comments they're making. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if there's time, but that's actually a segue into the bonus round, if there's time. If not, then I don't want to put any pressure on anyone. I think there's time. We, it's about five now. We have, a, we have half an hour, so. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would need three people. Ms. T, Ms. Tessa is the teacher in this um, example, Bobby, and then Adam, would I have any, and I'll be the narrator. Does anyone have an interest in helping me out with uh, the teaching of the Holocaust? Yeah. <coughs> so then, uh, I guess I'm doing all three parts. <laughs> Are you Miss T? Okay. Miss T, Bobby, Adam, so I'll give you some context into uh, Ms. T's work. Ms. T is a ninth grade teacher in a very different school district, different from Mr. Kirk's, that is. Um, so Eric, this is where my title is actually correct. So <laughs> this is the title that uh, I think was advertised. Um, so <coughs> part of my goal is to 
develop racially literate pre-service teachers, get, getting them thinking about what it means to be racially literate. I borrow from Skerritt to um, define racial literacy. I won't read that to you. You can take 30 seconds and certainly review it. And I think it, this definition also gets at some of your commentary. So from there, um, so Miss T was a really interesting teacher. She um, she recognized that she had a predominantly white experience in K-12, right? She knew this. Um, she was uh, born into a really privileged home. She knew this. She recognized this. You know, again, she didn't look like a lot of the research that talks about these sort of blindly privileged people, right? She was very aware um, of her privilege as a white woman um, whose family had means, right? So I'll just read some of what she says about herself here. I think that mostly because my experiences since grammar school, you know, the world isn't all white. And if you're being educated in a place where they're like, this whiteness is normal, this is life, you're learning to do all this stuff in a bubble. Once you leave that bubble, you realize how weird it was. My teachers didn't have to think about what is the context these kids are coming with. How can I explain this information to them in a way that relates to who they are? Um, so she took the opportunity to teach night as um, a text that attends to social justice goals. And, and Holocaust curriculum is well known as a curriculum that attends to social justice goals. So in her words, I would think, especially in a district that acknowledges how diverse it is, it would try to teach to diversity, and I don't know that it necessarily does that. I think the school itself and the district is very aware of the diversity of the student population, but I don't see, maybe with the exception of Ellie Wiesel's Night, I haven't really seen content that directly acknowledges diversity, accepting diversity, wanting to learn more about other cultures. I would think that with how proud the school is of its student diversity. So Knight really gave me that opportunity to talk about, you know, these are major world issues. Not perfectly articulated, right, but she had certain goals. Um, so to talk about her context a little bit, a ninth grade teacher at a very large high school. These were the demographics that they provided me for me, but um, what you should know is that there is no attention whatsoever to a sort of ethnic and cultural diversity in the school. The school had a very robust population um, of Chaldean students, many of whom were refugees. And the school demographics just didn't account for that whatsoever. So I don't know if those students identified as white or if the school identified them as white. So what you should know is that um, the school is really, really diverse, and her classrooms were really diverse. Um, and so alongside Mr. Curtin, alongside Mr. Antolini, I observed Miss Tessa for a year as well. Um, and we conducted a series of interviews where I got some of this data. Um, so she describes the problem. And I wanted my students to think about genocide in this way, that this is still happening, that if you get educated on the topic, you can be one of those to prevent it from happening again. So I wanted, to, to, I wanted them to think about this in a way that does affect you and knowing about the kinds of things that people can do, which I would consider teaching for social justice in a lot of ways. So, um, what you should know is that her department handed her the Holocaust curriculum and said, this is what we teach, this is what you will teach, and these are the themes assigned to your particular class. So you are teaching the Holocaust as a unique and incomparable event, and the themes will attend to individual agency and self-reliance. So this is how she was told to teach the Holocaust. Um, so we can now start then with Miss T, and I'll be the narrator. Oh, but I'll, I'll actually, before we get into it, I'll read um, a little context for you. 
Every year, teachers and students in English classrooms across the nation consume Holocaust curriculum. Holocaust studies have been cited for their potential to engage anti-racism by addressing prejudice and discrimination in myriad forms. Ms. T identifies Ellie Wiesel's memoir, Night, as one of the few opportunities her high school English curriculum provides to teach for social justice. By the time of the scene, students have been reading Night for about two weeks. The class discussion begins as follows. The conditions of the camps he's living in are superior to other camps. This is important to know. She explains the distinction between the labor camps and the <coughs> extermination camps. Birkenau, where conditions were much worse. Um, less food, the conditions were much worse. People were killed a lot more often for much fewer reasons. So the camp he's living in, um, Una, a labor camp, some days he doesn't even have it so bad there, okay? They're not getting a ton of food, they're getting enough to survive. At other camps, they didn't even have enough to survive. These things are very important. When winter comes around, they get thicker clothes. So that's a really short scene, and that's the end of that particular scene. Does anyone have thoughts about what they're seeing? <coughs> Besides, good God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just her talking. And if she wants to have a lesson where the students are experiencing something as applicable to their life, so it's just her getting her perspective that is, shall we say, skewed? Yeah. I yeah, think. skewed and maybe, um, <coughs> maybe missing. Detrimental in certain ways. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's cognitively dissonant from the experience of the Jewish children and their family histories in the folk war, yeah. for one thing. And I'm not understanding how she sees this as being incomprehensible or what does it have to do with individual agency and self reliance? Right, so we'll, we'll get there in just a minute. Um, I, I would agree with anyone who is groaning over her drawing distinctions between the various camps, right? That's just not a way we want to approach this. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of really, really problematic stuff going on here. So actually, we're not going to go there yet. Um, I'm going to read you some context for the next scene. Most students appear disengaged, not surprisingly, right, if this is her approach, um, stared into space or slept. Very few contributed to the discussion. Ms. T then turned the discussion toward a focus on the brutality these L experiences in the concentration camps, another example of individualism. It was at this point that Bobby, a black student who frequently challenged Ms. T, spoke up for the first time. Bobby, in what seemed to be a bout of sheer exasperation, sat hunched at his seat and expressed distaste for the novel. I don't like this book. You don't like this book. Why don't you like this book? It's stupid. It's not even, like, fun. Several students laugh at Bobby's comment. Do you think that it's meant to be fun? No, but the story's not good. It's like the same thing. He gets mad about something and he gets smacked around. Why do you think he tells the story this way if it's not good? Students begin talking at once. The cacophony of voices is unintelligible. Yes, he's telling his own story the way it happened. I think he's telling it so there won't be another Holocaust and so that people will know how to help. Yes, he's telling this story so that people will know what happened. Another student asks for clarification about the memoir's date of publication. Andy looks up this information and announces that it was first published in 1958. In 1958, there was segregation in the United States, so obviously it wouldn't help anything. Why would it not help anything? Oh, I'm sorry, I haven't been clicking through. Um, I get so into it, I forget to click. So. I think we'll, we should just continue without, um, the next scene I think will add more to this. Bobby's comment caused something of a commotion. Students began talking to each other and over each other. It took Miss T about one minute to regain her students' attention and finally did so after she calls out. Everybody, come back, quiet, please. I'm going over this because I think it's important. 
you are not the only person who doesn't like this book. There are plenty of people who don't like the book. And there are people that do like this book. There are a lot of people who like this book. The book is not necessarily written uh, to entertain. It's meant to inform so that it doesn't happen again. But it did, though. <laughs> it did in a way. But the idea is this is an extreme situation. There are genocides that happen throughout the world. Yeah. <laughs> Miss T made a grab for her copy of the memoir and reread a paragraph in the preface in another attempt to convince students, but perhaps mostly Bobby, of the memoir's utility. To forget would not be would be not only dangerous but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Do you understand what he's saying? Yes. He's saying that he doesn't want people to do this again. Ellie Stella's belief that by telling the story, people will be prepared and will understand that this kind of thing happens and will be able to stop it or at least understand before it happens again. Bobby, you were saying it did happen. How do you mean? It happens all the time. Segregation, I guess. Yes, so acts of inhumanity. Those have not stopped. Even in America, the idea of segregation and all that stuff. These things are real. What makes the Holocaust different is the scale of it. That's what I was trying to present in the beginning with the math and the numbers. Almost 11, 11 million people killed. The scale of this incident is something that we should, that should never be pushed to the side. So that's the end of that script. Um, I don't have the, I don't think I have, no, I don't have the entire script here, but any thoughts about any of it? Yeah. So I'm like super sensitive about women being attacked like this. So all of us were actually really fast to get nasty with her really fast because you allowed us to go there. We didn't with Mr. Kurt. A couple of us wanted to, but, but we weren't allowed to go that way. And I assume that's because he was kind of your better example and she's kind of the complicated example. Is she at a point in the school year where Mr. Kurt was? How long has she had her kids at this point? Yeah, so the Holocaust is typically taught in April, right? So this is approximately... April, and you would have said she does or does not have relationships with her students similar to Mr. Kurt. Um, it's a very different context. Right. So she has great relationships with some students and not with others. Uh -huh. But Mr. Kurt, you said, is beloved by all. He gets In a weird way. Yeah, it was just one of those weird... It's hard for me to, to listen to this, and I really want to get into her. It's clear she doesn't have the relationships to teach this book the way that I would want her to. Right. But I also would have said other things about Mr. Kurt that indicated he didn't do the right things. I'm having a hard time. There's like some sort of like something happening in my brain right now about us having a conversation about this because it seems so obvious what she's doing wrong. But to me, some other things that Mr. Kurt was doing were so obviously not okay either. So I'm just feeling some tension around us continuing the, like about this. I'm not sure why, but I just wanted to own that. It's hard for me. Uh, I'm not having such tension, so but <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> I feel bad. Uh, I guess one thing I noticed, uh, and sort of going back to the beginning, the in the context of you having shown us the pride and the slant, yes, that in the moments where the class there isn't a transcript because the class just starts all talking to each other, in her mind that doesn't count. Right? It's only once she gets them silent and there's one person talking at a time, then it's education is happening. Right. Right? We, she doesn't stop and say, oh, what were you talking about? Or listen in. Right? There's no, like, and I think that's a big part of this control thing, right? That right. regardless of her opinions of the Holocaust or her perception of it, that just the way she's teaching. And you could say Mr. Kurt didn't really have that opportunity, but he was still, like, it was him and them back and forth. There was no really as much between student stuff that counted, and I think that's important yeah. in any context. Yeah, I would agree with you. Absolutely. Sorry, there was no question there. I... <laughs> no, that there's a lot in that sort of chaos, right? There can be a lot if we allow So, that. okay, here's a question. Have you seen teachers more successfully capitalize on those moments where they've lost seeming control, but then are able to get something out of those conversations? Not new teachers. <clears throat> you know, the more experienced ones, absolutely. But uh, we're dealing with first-year teachers mm -hmm. here, so they're still trying to 
figure out things, right? As they should be. So, um, yeah, yes. Hi, I guess I have um, a comment as I'm thinking through and listening to this and then a question. Um, I think in each of the cases, um, the content that the teacher was trying to work with, um, in the first case it was their own agenda and in the second two cases there was a piece of literature that was attached to it. Yeah. So there was a forcing of the issue, yeah. trying to force the students into a conversation. Um, and it reminds me of the opposite um, way of engaging with students in the classroom, sure. difficult conversations like Rico Goodstein's work about generative themes, where the topics and the questions are generated by the students themselves, perhaps making it easier for a teacher to, in the moment, facilitate that conversation. Right. So it's not the, so much of a struggle. So then my question is, in thinking about working with pre-service teachers, is um, can you share um, what your impressions of the impact on using theater, uh, readers theater, to engage pre-service teachers in thinking about teaching as a political act, teaching as yeah. you know a social political act? Yeah. So I'm I'm currently working through that and still trying to figure out because I'm noticing my pre-service teachers, they sort of, they're invited to critique, they should critique, but I'm trying to figure out how to get them to move beyond the kind of ripping the teachers apart, you know? I don't know if it's in my presentation, I don't know if, if, if a script of a real life classroom scenario just inherently invites that sort of thing, um, but my, answer for that is really inadequate and in saying I'm currently trying to work toward that that purpose right teaching is every, every single thing you do is a political act in the classroom I'm trying to um, get them to understand this for sure but working through the sort of the difficulties that I experience with it's almost like they focus on certain things to deflect the harder stuff, I think. And I'm trying to get past that and, and failing, maybe, <laughs> at the moment. I don't know, just trying. And so it's ongoing. You know, it's a process for me, too. Um, but if I can think of examples, specific ones, I will email Eric, and I'll make sure he gets it over to you. So, yeah, did so. I, is that a hand? Um, oh, OK. You Okay. Um, you, you said these are, you know, mostly new teachers, and and I would say that this kind of subject matter, and you know, when I read like racial literacy, to me, racial literacy, I don't know how long I'd have to study that to really feel like I was good at it and good at it enough to to engage as a teacher. You know, I've done some of my own work and I've participated in some programs with the Anti Defamation League specifically around this and like with in your face stuff you know intensive things over weekends um and you know and even that's that's not experiencing what some of the challenges are for for people that are not white in this country so that that's the number one so number two i'll, I'll make it an equation with with like other subject matter where mathematics would be incredibly difficult for me, but mathematics, this it's all there. If you can understand it and get to the rules of it and you have a mind for that, you should be able to sort of teach that. To me, I would say this would be a million times more difficult. It's it's you know, it's it's got a lot of emotional, political, social charge to it. Yeah. And to say that, you know, like with math or some other chemistry, there's going to be some objective subject matter there that's not going to change. This is going to be subject matter that's different for everybody in this room. Yeah. And so, you know, for any teacher to try to mediate a discussion with students and to do it in a way that's somehow going to be 
um, you know, I wouldn't expect to steer this in any particular direction would be what I would say. That might be the first message to any new teacher, which is that this may go anywhere and just be prepared for it to go anywhere um, because even the most seasoned teachers and probably even the most seasoned experts on racial discussion and discourse are going to be challenged, you know, because Bobby's going to be there. And I was going to ask you, you said April. April what year? Do you know? Uh, this was 2013. What? 2013. Okay. So I could say, well, it could have been, it could have been April 2015. You know, so context of what's going on in the world of the students which any year in the last two years in terms of, you know, in any year for the last 400 years for certain races, there's a context there that, you know, maybe this is Bobby's way of interrupting, but maybe this is the interrupting that has to happen. Oh, agreed. Agreed. Bobby does incredible things. Not everyone has access to the transcript here. Uh, it's kind of lengthy, so I only put some of it up here. But Bobby is doing incredible things. You know, he's making connections in ways that are meaningful to him, and she's shutting it down. Um, and that's something I want my pre-service teachers to see. You know, learning to notice when we shut down the learning that students are doing in the moment. Um, and then, on top of that, learning how not to do that. You know, embracing what the student, the connections students are making. Um, I actually, I was thinking of your question from before too. And I actually, so last semester when I was doing a lot of this stuff, we culminated the semester with projects. Um, and the projects were really open-ended in terms of go outside, on campus, in a classroom, wherever, and um, you're going to do a project on, on analyzing a racial artifact, right? So I, I think some of the politics that they were beginning to understand were embedded in their projects. So um, a couple of groups actually did projects on how my university is racist, right? And, and they brought in all of these examples about um, things that have occurred on campus and the way that administration has and has not responded, um, the ways by which particular groups on campus are positioned. Um, we have something called the, I don't know how much of this I, I don't know if I'm implicating myself here just as a professional at another place, but um, we have an initiative called 2020 and our school wants 20% of our student population to consist of students of color. Um, because that more so matches the surrounding area. 20% of the surrounding school districts consists, 20% uh, uh, of the student populations in our surrounding school districts are students of color. And as a university, we don't match our community. So as an, an initiative, we want to be attractive to a diverse student population. So this, this 2020 initiative, 20% by the year 2020. So the students are bringing in projects saying, that's never gonna happen until X, Y, and Z changes are made, right? So something happened over the semester that got them thinking about their institution um, and the experiences they have and the experiences other people have, and they were thinking very politically about that. So as a sort of small example that may or may not do well to answer your question. I don't know, but yeah, yeah, yes. So I'm, I'm really interested in this dynamic that you have alluded to a few times, the institutionalized racism and interpersonal. Um, I think you were saying racism. Yep. Um, and so I think that if you look at institutional racism, you also have to recognize that people are involved there. It's not just institutions, right? Um, and I think something that both Ms. T and uh, Mr. Kurt are doing is speaking, speaking with, with declarative authority mm -hmm. in that this is what you should learn. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to refer back to the comments here, uh, I think this kind of discussion can't be declarative. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, I, I guess my question is, how, how do you 
talk to new teachers about being a part of an institution that is a school that has all sorts of you know, uh, trappings about being an institution. Yeah. And the classroom as a space, an institutionalized space. But also a person in that. Yeah. And so you are representing that institution. You're also trying to be a person who has to deal with these things. Is there a way of speaking personally, of describing how this is really difficult and that the teacher is not removed from it? In yeah. a way that the, the students need to learn this, but I already have. Does that yeah, make sense? so the by already the but I already have piece is sort of problematic, right? Because I don't think any of us can really say that. Um, this actually reminds me of a piece that I wrote for Ed Week Teacher, and that piece was called "Why Are All the Teachers White?" And this this question you ask, I mean, I'm very forthcoming with students. You are sitting in this classroom because school served you well. And throughout the semester, you are going to come to terms with why that is, right? You've had good relationships with your teachers. You've had good experiences in schools. I've never met a pre-service teacher in my classrooms who hated school, hated the experience of it, did not do well academically as defined by others, and then went on to want to be a teacher. I've, I've never met that kind of person. So I, I talk to the pre-service teachers about who they are, where, why they're here, and coming to terms with why they're here. You enjoy school, right? And you got something out of it, and it served you, and you, you reaped massive benefits from it. Why is this, right? So at the end of my piece, um, I encourage people to think about why school served you well, because the piece was responding to a New York Times op-ed um, asking where the teachers of color are. And I don't think that's the appropriate focus. For me, the focus is, why are all the teachers white? If they're the ones having these really positive experiences with school, like, what would we expect, you know? And I can't speak to what everyone's experiences in school would be, but I want my pre-service teachers coming to terms with why school served them well. Because it, it gets them thinking a little differently about why they want to be teachers. Right? And they're going to be teachers of students for whom school is not serving well. So just thinking about that and being really forthcoming about it too. Can I ask Carla, have you seen that in classrooms? Seen what? Um, teachers speaking from that sort of personal point of view to their students. To the, no, I haven't. Um, I mean, it's just not for any reason other than I, when I go out to schools, I'm doing different things. I'm field instructing, I'm supervising. So I'm not necessarily going to see those conversations unless I'm conducting a study taking place in schools on these kinds of things. Um, so no, I haven't seen those kinds of conversations going down. So my, um, one of my jobs, I think, is to just get them aware of these things. Because many of them come to pre-service teaching not thinking for a minute about why they are there, other than that they just really want to be teachers because they've had such great teachers and, you know, life was great K through 12. And I think Stephen King said something like, anyone who looks fondly upon middle school and high school, like there's something wrong with those people. <laughs> so, you know, I want my pre-service teachers thinking about that. I'm like, what's wrong with you? I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm curious to know, um, in, the, um, in the desire to teach or use critical race theory or teach whiteness studies, how often does that happen with all white texts? Meaning, like, do you see a difference in how teachers use critical race theory or teach whiteness studies if they're focusing on Catcher in the Rye, for example, and so much of Holden's anxiety has to do with its whiteness? Um, instead of looking at texts where there might be racial conflict or there might be a difference in terms of who's pictured on the front and who gets to narrate it. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have witnessed a difference in conversations, especially in terms of trying to interrogate whiteness when there's nothing on the table but whiteness versus a text where you might right. see racial conflict um, right. and then try to talk about whiteness through that racial conflict. So that, um that sort of reminds me of a couple of people who have said that 
whiteness does not need to be examined in the context of racial diversity. Whiteness can be examined on its own. I would argue that the canon is a racialized text, right? So to answer your question, I actually have not seen, I'm still working on other data, so I haven't seen the sort of data that you're asking about yet, but I think that would be a great question. What are people, what are they doing with white texts, right? Especially because that's what's still mandated in schools. You know, teachers everywhere are still required to teach Shakespeare. Maybe they um, teach texts by people of color in February, right? But that's still the way schools are operating, so that would be an interesting question. Um, but I haven't seen that just yet. But I would argue that all text is racialized text, and it does not require the presence of people of color in order to make it a racialized text. Yeah, I guess I, I would completely agree with you. I, I think my inclination is to think that if you focus on whiteness, it might be enough. Yeah, yeah if, I'm, I'm wondering if you have an all white text, if, if students are more able to interrogate but they're there's more able to. Yeah, there's something about the presence of brown and black bodies right. that makes the focus you put on a thin. So when you think about the dialogue that takes place, it's like, well, this would be unfair if black people were treat, treated this way. That's true, but if the teacher is trying to get you to see the privileges of whiteness or how white power works, I wonder how effective that conversation can be once you remove the, the other from right. the discourse and be able to interrogate kind of how the difference would Right, you know, I, I'd love to see that happening in schools too. Um, I'm not sure that I would, I'm not sure any of us would actually see that happening mm -hmm. in a regular classroom setting, um, just given the way things are going. But I, I love that question and I think it's a great question and that's one I'll keep in mind for sure. I just want to point out, um, I. So this idea, this theme of uniqueness and comparability, right? This particular teacher had um, Middle Eastern students in her class, many of whom escaped their home country at a certain point in their childhood. And so to teach the Holocaust as something as unique and incomparable, when they too have experienced oppressive regimes, is really problematic, right? So we talk about that. Um, we talk about this idea, and this is um, in the research, the Holocaust has been given so much attention because of its location within white borders, right? We're not often talking about other Holocausts. There's a reason for that, right? So we talk about um, why this is, and we ask questions about that. Um, I also show them this image, you know, to respond to that uniqueness and incomparability. If you look at the estimated genocides from 1900 to 2005, I don't know that uniqueness holds a lot of water, right? Do you then also talk about the institutional racism at the district level and that this first year teacher is being given? I mean, if I looked at this as a first year teacher, I would be terrified to think about the amount of research I need to do to even walk into a classroom and teach a book that I was given without any lesson plans and understanding of how to be a really good teacher or to classroom manage a group of kids who I didn't know maybe in an area where I'm not from. I mean, this for me is, is incredibly powerful and at the same time very daunting for a first year teacher. So this leads me to talk more about institutional racism and district level and what ways as a teacher we need to be critical thinkers yep. uh, as opposed to like it's your job and right responsibility to doubt everything that's given to you and then know every genocide that occurs to you. Don't I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, that's ridiculous, right? That We couldn't expect that. Um, I, I want a teacher just ready, even if it's too risky to ask questions of their administration, I want them asking themselves questions, you know? Um, so this, is it, so yeah, she was required to do certain things. They're all, we're all required to do certain things. It doesn't mean we have to do them blindly and without agency, right? So that's part of the work that I do. I also find this um, image really interesting because the US and Australia are oddly sort of innocent, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, I'm just, I'm not expecting to um, develop social justice warriors. I think that's actually really problematic. Um, 
but I am hoping to develop people capable of asking questions about the work that they do, um, which I think will allow them to have more agency within that work. If they don't know that they should be asking questions or if they don't know the questions to ask, then it's just sort of, they're proceeding like little robots, right? Um, so those, yeah, on the topic of asking questions, those are some of the questions. And, and really the point was to talk about how her teaching was really at odds with her goals. And not everyone realizes when that's happening, right? You have goals, but then the things you have to do are totally counter to those goals. And we just sort of do those things without ever thinking about it. So my goal is to make that dissonance really explicit. This was, you know, she was critiquing her school, right? Her deliciously diverse school. It was an awesome school to be in. It was so interesting. And she was critiquing her school for not really paying much attention to its own diverse student population. And I thought that was a really great place to begin. So I think we're actually a couple minutes over now. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut things off here. You guys have proven very good at asking questions. So give yourselves a round of applause, but mostly give a round of applause to Christina Bertini. And I just wanna remind people that we are gonna continue tomorrow morning at Amazing Grace Luther Lutheran Church down in East Baltimore. So if that's convenient for you, I'd love to see you there around 9.30 and you can find that information on the Urban Health Institute's website, urbanhealth.jhu.edu. So thanks so much for coming out, and I'm sure you can, if you had a last question, come on up, and there's, there'll be a little time to chat. <laughs>